Um, our next speaker is Professor Christopher Totten. Uh, he's an associate professor of criminal justice in the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice at Kennesaw State University. Uh, Dr. Totten's research areas span criminal procedure and law, international crime, um, with a focus on courts and adjudication, and law and social science. His scholarly publications include 16 referred articles, either published or in press, one co-authored book, Criminal Procedure for the Criminal Justice Professional, and one book chapter. Also on our panel, we will have Mr. Bellinger. John Bellinger is a partner, partner in Arnold and Porter's National Security and Public International Law Practices. Before joining um, that law firm, Mr. Bellinger had several um, senior presidential appointments in the U.S. government, including the legal advisor of the Department of State from 2005 to 2009 under State, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. He was also senior associate counsel and the president and legal advisor to the National Security Council at the White House from 2001 to 2005. Further, we also have Professor Bradley with us. Uh, professor Bradley is a William Van Alstein professor of law and professor of public policy studies at Duke University. Um, he's also the co-director of the Center for International and Comparative Law. His scholarly expertise spans the areas of international law in the US legal systems, constitutional law and foreign affairs, and federal jurisdictions, and his courses include international law, foreign relations law, and federal courts. He is the founding co-director of the Duke School Center for International Comparative Law and serves on the executive board of Duke Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security. So now we have um, Dr. Toten, and his paper is on the adjudication of foreign official immunity, determination in the United States, and beyond post semitar Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to be using a uh, slide presentation, but uh, and I have an assist, my research assistant here, um, James Purden, from our graduate program in criminal justice to assist, um, and also James has been assisting with the, some of the research for this as well. Um, so Mantar, as you probably know, is a very landmark case in this area. Um, so Mantar was a former first vice president, minister of defense in charge of uh, military and prime minister of Somalia, um, and the plaintiff sought damages under the TVPA and ATS for torture and extrajudicial killings. Um, that had been implicitly authorized um, by Samantar. Um, and the big question here was whether FISA, um, um, FISA governs Samantar's claim of immunity. Um, and it turns out that um, um, no, co the common law uh, is going to govern um, Samantar's claim of immunity. Um, so that's sort of the rub. Um, individual suit, the rationale, individual suit for conduct undertaken in official capacity is not a foreign state under the uh, F FSIA. Um, Essentially, um, individuals don't fall into that definition of foreign state. Um, in particular, they're not entities, according to the, the Supreme Court in, um, in Samantar, um, not agencies or instrumentalities. Uh, legislative history of FISA also shows no intent to include individual officials uh, within the me meaning of agency or instrumentality. Um, can we move on? Um, other parts of the FISA. Um, it turns out, um, explicitly mention individuals when intended to count their acts as equal to the foreign state. Um, other, foreign, uh, other provisions of um, FISA, rather, um, dealing with method of service and remedies, counsel against applying the foreign state um, definition to the individual. Um, also, uh, FISA didn't codify the common law um, regarding individual official immunity. FISA did. Um, the slide mentions the legislative history of FISA showed no intent also to include individuals within the meaning of agency or instrumentality. Um, if we move on, um, we, we, con we commented on these, so I think we can go one more. Um, indiv individual official immunity, um, not a problem. Congress was responding to uh, when it passed FISA. Um, there weren't many of these cases to begin with at the time FISA was adopted. Um, and it looked like um, uh, it appears Congress and the State Department wanted to maintain state's role in these individual SOI determinations. Um, the, the court in Samantar said there's no, um, no concern on artful pleading by the plaintiffs to avoid FISA and apply the common law. Um, if the state is immune under FISA, um, the suit may be dismissed regardless of um, the immunity of the official. Um, some actions against an official in official capacity um, it should be treated as actions against the state itself as the state's the real party in interest. Um, so essentially here, um, what we're saying is some of these suits um, are actually going to be um, pled under, uh, actually be, be held um, under FISA um, and not the common law. Um, and that's just um, a matter of the fact that um, in terms of the way that the suit is actually pled. Um, and we're going to um, go with uh, FISA um, in some of these official uh, suits. Um, move on one more. Um, uh, one more. Um, here, P sued Samantar in private capacity seeking ma money damages from his pockets. Um, therefore, the common law applies. Um, we're actually um, looking here, um, go going after the official um, in his in individual personal capacity. Um, and that's why we're applying the common law instead of, um, you know, uh, 
suing the state, if you will, for, for money damages, um, we're actually going against the individual, and therefore the court in Samantar said um, the common law applies. The text, purpose, and history of FISA um, dictates that um, FISA does not, does not govern Samantar's claim of immunity. Um, it's going to be under the uh, common law. Interesting that customary international law and international law in general were not mentioned here. Um, it was in the party's briefs, um, but it just didn't show up in the Samantar decision. Uh, moving on. On remand, uh, the Fourth Circuit, um, the State Department now issues its um, SOI, Executive Branch um, SOI, opposing the immunity for Samantar, um, and it gave uh, some of the reasons why it opposed Samantar's immunity. Um, no official government to request such immunity, um, as well as uh, Samantar having ties to the U.S. as a permanent legal resident. Um, the district court views the SOI as determinative, or at least I'm entitled to significant deference, but the appeals court um, evaluates uh, deference here differently. Um, and it basically it looks at um, that difference between the uh, conduct immunity, uh, functional immunity, and the um, personal or status immunity. Um, and it looked at that post-schooner exchange line of cases uh, for foreign sovereigns and found a, com a complete lack of uh, binding deference um, up until the 1920s. Um, but actually, if we go on to the 1930s, um, the State Department executive branch guidance now in the area um, is saying we're going to, uh, it's going to be binding. I um, mean, we're going to follow, uh, it's, essentially the courts are going to follow executive branch guidance in this area. Um, but the two-step process em emerges where the state is, um, department, uh, the state representative rather the foreign government requests immunity. Um, and if it's granted, the, the jurisdiction um, uh, is surrendered by the court. Uh, if, if there's no SOI, um, then uh, the court still makes this decision based on um, the policies uh, of the executive uh, in prior uh, cases. Um, and the Tate letter did little to kind of change that issue, um, but the fit decisions overall were scarce in the pre-FISA error. Um, the Constitution, Section 3, gives that um, ambassador um, uh, power, if you will, uh, the, receipt, the receipt of ambassador powers, um, and essentially um, rec the recognition of heads of state by implication. Um, and what the court said, the Fourth Circuit said, um, the U.S. treats executive branch SOIs um, essentially as binding here um, because it's a function of that constitutional power to recognize a head of state. Um, so on the on this uh, status immunity, if we go forward, thank the right here actually. Um, the court um, does deny um, immunity. Uh, why why does it do that? It says that the state uh, the state um, department SOI in this case is um, binding. Um, it's, it goes back to that constitutional issue with uh, head of state immunities. But this is the rub. Um, it turns out that the Fourth Circuit, uh, where this matter was remanded back from, this, uh, from the Supreme Court, um, actually said on the conduct-based immunity piece, um, the ex executive branch has some role um, in its SOIs, but it's not entitled to complete deference. Um, so that, that's interesting there. Um, we give substantial weight, but not binding weight, according to the Fourth Circuit, um, interpreting Samantar. Um, we look at the branch's diplomatic impact of the case. Um, to determine uh, this, uh, the, the immunity issue for foreign officials, we look at domestic and international law. So here the Fourth Circuit actually is looking at international law um, and the, uh, the, the Samantha at the Supreme Court level didn't look at international law, which is kind of interesting. Um, FASA codified international law, um, so we need to um, interpret uh, the, uh, the common law um, now in, in line with international law. Um, and CIL distinguishes between status-based um, and the conduct-based. So uh, the court, the Fourth Circuit, again, looking at that distinction between um, those two immunities, functional immunity on the one hand and head of state on the other. Um, and essentially, if we move on to the next slide, um, the U.S. Supreme Court in the Underhill v. Hernandez case from 1897 embraced that international norm that sovereign uh, immunity belongs to the state, um, uh, it rather it extends to um, officials' acts on behalf of the state, um, as long as um, the, the effect of enforcing the rule, be, uh, or rather, um, as long as the effect of exercising jurisdiction would be an enforce a rule against the state. Um, moving on, um, several FISA decisions, according to the Fourth Circuit, um, find that FISA incorporates this principle of international law, um, that foreign officials can claim immunity for official acts, but not private ones. Um, so again, um, you know, the, the Fourth Circuit here is looking not just at international law and its distinction between those two immunities, but also looking at some of these FISA cases that, um, though not technically on point, because now we're in a common law regime uh, for individual immunity, um, the court said, the Fourth Circuit said, are instructive on this issue um, of, of the distinction between the two types of immunities, and I, we found several cases on that. Um, if we move on, uh, the, the um, P alleges Samantar cannot raise conduct um, immunity related to the violations of just cogens um, because of, you know, the, the severity of those uh, types of uh, violations as peremptory norms, uh, you know, we can't deviate, et cetera. Um, but under domestic international law, um, the, the Fourth Circuit said just cogens violations are by their nature um, official. They're not private. Um, uh, so. Um, um, it turns out that in this area, um, I, I, let, me, let me restate that, um, they're not officially sanctioned. Um, so um, indeed, um, we're going to maybe be able to pierce the veil of immunity, if you will. 
Um, and as we go to the next slide, we see an increasing trend on the international law, according to the First Circuit, um, to deny this foreign official immunity. Um, U.S. courts are fo fo following this trend of a um, just code, just exception, according to the Fourth Circuit, according to the Fourth, fourth Circuit in a, in a few cases it's cited. Um, and then under international and domestic law, um, essentially the conclusion here is foreign officials are not entitled to immunity for these peremptory norms. If we move on, um, please raise their claim under TVPA. The court looks at the um, legislative history here. Um, and finds there should be no official immunity for um, just cogents um, under the um, legislative history of that Torture Victim Protection Act. Um, so in a sense, um, we'd undermine TVPA um, if we end up finding immunity uh, for these officials. So uh, moving on, uh, because Samantha Nittar allegedly committed acts, the conclusion here is not entitled um, to conduct-based immunity because he committed these acts um, of peremptory norms. Also, the state um, SOI was was looked at for a, um, you know, for it, that, that amount of weight, if you will, that's not controlling but, but considerable or significant, um, and it um, gave the court in the Fourth Circuit another basis, if you will, um, of support for its decision um, that state also didn't recognize um, immunity for Samantar. Um, so, that, so essentially we have a piggybacking going on here of um, you know, international law as interpreted by the Fourth Circuit um, as well as, um, as the domestic executive branch SOI. Uh, so, you know, that, that did come into play, it speaks to this issue, we can move on, um, that I'll mention later this, this slide here, um, as well as uh, towards the end about, um, you know, how much deference to give uh, the SOIs and, and their role in, in, in this issue and the importance of the SOI uh, to inform the court's decisions. Uh, this is the, this, the split, um, the Second Circuit in Lashkar, um, this involved a, a terrorism event in, in um, uh, Mumbai, um, and it turns out that uh, we had some uh, foreign officials here from another state, Pakistan, um, who essentially were helping with planning and, and supporting the, um, the terrorist acts. Um, and so the idea was, um, you know, uh, the, the suit rather was based on a plaintiff's um, attempts to, to um, civilly uh, receive damages or obtain damages against these uh, Pakistani officials for helping to orchestrate the, the bombings in India and Mumbai. Um, the State Department issues this SOI um, essentially um, according um, immunity under the um, uh, common law. Um, so it's SOI um, sought, um, sought a grant of immunity. Uh, we can move on. Um, the district court here defers absolutely to the SOI. So this is very much unlike the Fourth Circuit. Um, the Second Circuit um, is deferring absolutely to the executive SOI. Um, and also said there's no just cogens exception, um, which also um, is in conflict with um, what the, uh, we just said the, the, um, the Fourth Circuit had said in, in, the, um, in the remand on Samantar. Um, so, and this was just affirmed in 2014, um, the Second Circuit um, essentially found that executive SOI in a foreign official immunity case binding, um, and also found no Jez Cogens exception um, just last year. Um, we also found um, this uh, district um, of D.C. opinion um, essentially also refusing um, a Judge Cogent's exception for foreign official immunity it would place a strain upon the courts and our diplomatic relations. It would also eviscerate um, any protections for foreign official immunity, um, the Geraldo case. Um, and they relied on FISA decisions for that holding. Moving on to the head of state immunity um, issues. Um, it turns out that um, here we have um, the president of Sri Lanka, or Sri Lanka, sorry, under the TVPA being sued. Um, and uh, U.S. also filed an SOI executive uh, branch uh, suggestion here affirmatively granting immunity, um, and the district court did find it um, controlling in this case. Um, th this decision, if we move on, um, it turns out we can, you know, the reasoning here, the, the two-step process, the post-schooner exchange re regime um, of absolute uh, foreign sovereign immunity for um, states, including their heads, heads um, but, it, you know, it turns out that we see this trend um, in many other decisions. Um, so uh, essentially, uh, the FISA cases too support this trend of um, uh, finding um, absolute deference to uh, state executive branch SOIs for heads of state. And if we uh, move on one more slide. Um, one of the reasons here was the Constitution. Um, essentially, um, the president's role in determining foreign policy needs to be respected in this uh, head of state um, uh, context. And therefore, uh, we give binding deference to um, the department uh, or executive branches, SOIs in this area uh, because of the constitutional issues dealing with foreign policy. Um, and that courts are ill-equipped, -equip the, suit the suitability argument, um, to make these kinds of policy determinations on immunity heads of state. Um, they also find, found um, TVPA legislative history, uh, le legislative history rather, um, intended to um, a, 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 that it essentially express this idea of, of um, immunity for heads of state. Um, and so that was in there too. I mean, if we move on, we have this, uh, um, you know, essentially this long string site here of cases that are in a core with maintaining head of state immunity, uh, follow the executive branch SOI, um, and you know from cases in the con you know the context of Rwandan genocide, um, you know to Ghana where there was actually a unique case where there was no SOI for the head of state, um, but other um, other. Uh, 
points, if you will, or, uh, or um, other uh, reasons uh, supported the uh, finding of immunity in the case of the um, head of state from Ghana. Comedy, um, international law and maintenance of friendly relations, no private um, activity exception if we move on. Um, the Iranian case against the Ayatollah, um, the former president of Iran, um, as well as um, um, uh, rather the, the Ayatollah Khomeini and the former president um, Abedinim, uh, Abedinejad. Um, and it turns out here um, the, we have uh, suits under the ATS, TVPA, and, um, and FSIA uh, for extrajudicial killings and imprisonment. Uh, regarding these officials, um, the court considered the application of the common laws um, and didn't look at FISA, uh, another post Samantar uh, uh, case focusing on common law. And, um, in effect here, this is what I was saying I think earlier, is um, the court um, considered uh, the state the real party in interest and not the official. Um, so uh, that's because the state had an interest uh, of the, essentially um, dictating that the state be present because without the state, um, its interests could be um, jeopardized and it had a right to be there to defend its interests. Um, and Iran then, in other words, the suit became a suit under FISA, right, because Iran was seen as the, the, the real party in interest. Um, as opposed to a suit under the common law. Um, and again, that's because um, of the, uh, the court looked at the nature of the allegations, um, if we move on, um, as well as um, the theory of the case. Um, the, pl the plaintiffs alleged they were suing two Iranian officials in their official as opposed to personal capacities. Um, and because of the way um, the plaintiffs framed their allegations, because of the theory of the case, um, the court here considered this to be a case um, uh, where the state was the real party of interest because these were um, uh, officials doing um, these uh, essentially crimes on behalf of the state, uh, the Iranian regime. Um, and that's a way to sort of, if you will, um, kind of go back to the FISA regime. Um, and it might be that, as you, we all know, that all these exceptions under FISA for immunity, um, you might be able to uh, there uh, chip away, if you will, um, at head of state immunity if you can get the case um, uh, regarded as a, um, as a case against the state as opposed to the official. Um, you may be able to apply some of these uh, commercial activity exceptions and the like. Um, move on to the analysis. Um, five minutes, OK. Um, post Samantar courts fo uh, followed this well-established common law practice on head, head of state immunity, um, absolute deference to the executive branch on constitutional and pragmatic grounds that we've mentioned. Um, um, they're only making the independent evaluation on um, head of state um, if there's no SOI. And then, but we're still following the policy of the state. If we move on, um, international uh, law here, the Belgium arrest case, um, certainly supports immunity uh, um, for sitting heads of state, uh, foreign ministers. Um, so there's definitely support here from the international law as well. Uh, uh, we can move on. One possible exception might be the private, um, this private character. Uh, notion that was brought up originally in Schooner uh, way back when, the absolute foreign immunity, uh, sovereign immunity case. Um, and so um, you might see a parallel there between um, that notion uh, and what was going on in, in, in FISA um, with the commercial activity exception. So we might be able to pierce the veil of immunity um, looking at this as a, as a private um, uh, type of um, endeavor, i.e. the drug trafficking or um, fraud case or something like that. Maybe a weak exception um, for head of state immunity and ju for Judge Cochin's violations because we can look at some of these international criminal courts um, that, that have uh, in the Rome statute and others that have this immunity for um, heads of state and other officials. Uh, but it turns out this is the criminal setting, right, rather than the cases we've been talking about today, um, the civil damages area. Plus, these are international courts and not, um, not you know, the ICC, obviously. And, and uh, we've been talking today about the national domestic courts. So it's a weak um, reason to justify uh, Judge Cogens' um, exception for head of state immunity. If we move on. Um, um, you might still, if, you know, you, this is my, I think I spoke to this, is this idea of um, FISA being applied um, in some suits against heads of state um, because essentially the state's viewed um, as the real party in interest um, and we might be able to pierce the veil under FISA in a roundabout way. Uh, moving on. Um, uh, there's obviously cases from the FISA, FISA era where we can uh, pierce fail in head of state immunity. Um, that might be um, because the U.S. government doesn't recognize the state, um, uh, or the official rather, as head of state, the Somalia um, situation, um, or the waiver issue. Um, so there are ways to pierce, pierce the veil in the head of state context, but they're limited. Um, certainly waiver comes to mind, but again, the practicality of that might be an issue as well. Um, foreign official immunity, uh, post Samantar, um, retains the common law conduct based official um, uh, immunity regime that has its roots in CIL. The courts are citing um, international law now, um, unlike Samantar. Um, there is a split among these courts, as we mentioned, um, the circuit courts that are interpreting Samantar um, on how much weight to give these executive SOIs, whether to have a just cogens, moving on. Question whether, as a result of the uh, Moving on, um, question as a result of um, the English House of Lords decision um, that was recently upheld by the ECHR in recent ICJ case, um, post-Samantar um, cases. Uh, what did we, yeah. 
I wanted to get to that one, but I'm not sure. Oh, maybe we're going back. So apologize for the slight delay. I'm um, question whether, um, as a result of the English House of Lords decision in Jones, recently upheld by the uh, ECHR, um, the Court of Human Rights in Europe, and the recent IJ, ICJ case, the Farini line of cases, um, it, with the ICJ, the jurisdictional immunity case by the ICJ, these post semantic cases finding no official immunity, just cogent's exception, um, are in violation of CIL because foreign um, conduct, uh, official um, conduct immunity um, from civil suits exists completely for these officials uh, following Jones and, and this, these more recent updates to Jones. Um, so the question is uh, whether, say, the Fourth Circuit now is in violation of customary international law uh, because Jones and its progeny um, are essentially finding um, that there's um, no exceptions in the civil um, immunity context, um, you know, no just cogens exception, um, and, and, uh, and so that could be problematic. Uh, we may need a different method of settlement for these civil cases, um, i.e. using an executive branch congressional override of CIL, if, if that's something we wanted to do. Um, we might also uh, use le um, a legislative override. Um, it, so there's two ways to override CIL here in the, in the la uh, on the impunity issue or the accountability issue. Um, and that might be through an amendment to FISA um, or the TVPA itself can help us pierce the veil um, in cases of torture, extrajudicial killings um, as an override to, uh, of customary inter uh, international laws developed in Jones and its progeny. Um, maybe criminal prosecutions through some of these universal jurisdiction statutes is another way to go about this in the foreign official immunity context, i.e. the torture convention and the U.S. Um, uh, codification and U.S. law of the torture convention. Um, so using criminal prosecutions to get around the, um, this uh, developing uh, um, immunity veil, if you will, in the civil context. Um, and then the waivers there. If we move on, okay, in the minute I have, the split issue of these um, uh, on how much weight to give the SOIs is, is interesting, and I think it means that going forward, um, state needs to even be more clear and specific um, as to why it's granting or denying immunity in, for, denying immunity in foreign official cases. Um, and that's because um, that, that instruction, if you will, could tip the balance um, in favor of the state's position or view, given the fact that some of these are not going to be considered controlling. Um, there's a lack of um, uniformity and consistency um, among circuits, um, and this um, means it may lead to inconsistent court decisions. Some courts might say, um, for a just, we're going to pierce the veil in just cogent's cases. Others may say not, depending on how, um, if they consider the executive SOI binding. Um, so we may see inconsistency in court decisions, as we saw in the Fourth and Second Circuit now. Um, and then moving on, there's this potential for lack of uniformity um, among executive UI, um, SOIs due to the political pressure issue. Um, it might be, as I finish up here, um, that um, just like in uh, the, the we saw this with uh, pre-FISA era, where state, um, you know, it was a highly more politicized, and we wanted FISA um, to have it, have the whole thing less politicized um, by foreign countries. Um, putting political pressure on, on state. Um, that happened in the pre-FISA era, um, and now we might see it again, um, you know, saying we only do common law, um, the complication of common law um, to foreign official immunity. Um, so we might, we might um, go back to that pre-FISA regime, um, which could also lead to a lack of consistency and uniformity, because in some cases, state may say, based on political pressure, we're going to have immunity, um, and then on other cases, um, no immunity. So um, that's an issue. Um, I know I'm out of time. I had a, I, I move on one more. I, I don't know, do, do you, could I? Um, ask for two more minutes, is that okay? I'll be very quick, but this is like gets to the heart of, so well maybe we should do a congressional override. I think in the case of, of CIL, given Jones and his progeny, maybe head of state's an easier candidate to codify, um, you know, and that's because um, essentially that there's a default presumption of immunity. Um, but we could defer um, to the executive SOI, um, uh, uh, given the constitutional issues, if, um, if in turn um, state indicates no immunity, we may defer um, to state, given state's role in the um, you know, constitutional role in, in immunity grants. Um, also, foreign state waives then no immunity in the head of state context. This avoids that political pressure issue I was talking about. Um, it makes it a more legal, purely legal decision. Um, it might save time, avoid that case-by-case -case approach to codify head of state immunity in the way I described. Um, moving on, um, the last slide here, foreign official immunity. Um, uh, here I'm saying a default of presumption of immunity except for foreign state waivers. A private activity exception where the state also acknowledges the action is not official, so going back to that consent issue. Um, um, but if the state remains silent, um, we might apply the private activity exception as well and, and pierce the veil on foreign official cases, again, a way to codify um, this uh, given its, uh, the, the state of flux, if you will, that um, uh, immunity term determinations are um, post-Samantar. Um, in the common law. And then finally, um, executive branch SOI recommending non-state immunity may be entitled to some weight um, given state's role in customary international law development, um, foreign affairs. 
um, but not necessarily a binding weight um, because the constitutional basis here isn't as strong. Um, of course, it's very strong in the status um, area with heads of state, but not necessarily in the conduct area. Um, it's more, that's more about the actions, if you will, of the officials. So there, in that regard, what I have here um, is, uh, as a proposal for codifying uh, foreign official immunity, say, through congressional action, um, might only involve, uh, might be like the Fourth Circuit, essentially, um, not giving uh, binding deference to state, but certainly um, giving it a high degree of respect. Um, well, that's my, that's my full presentation. I apologize for going over by about two minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That was a lot uh, in, in a short amount of time. I'm amazed. Uh, so uh, I'm also more of a practitioner here. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't have a tenure piece to have to write. So I don't have any slides. I actually have not written. Uh, I've, I've written in the past in this area, but I don't have anything new. So to a certain extent, I'm going to speak more to the students in the back than to the academics in the front. Although, Kurt, I think there'll be a couple of nuggets that you can pull out here. Um, so I, I'm going to give a practitioner's perspective on foreign official immunity, both from my time at the State Department, where I had to make these determinations, and now a good chunk of my practice since leaving government has been representing foreign governments and foreign officials in these cases where we are arguing for immunity of foreign government officials. Um, let me just start at the 100,000-foot level. Very briefly, academics know all this, but I'm sitting here thinking for the students um, that there's an awful lot flying around here, so I just want to go quickly. There are, as you know, there are a number of different kinds of foreign government official immunity, and they are all governed by different bodies of law. Uh, heads of state, uh, heads of state, which basically means heads of government or heads of state, uh, and also means foreign ministers, even though they're not heads of state, they have absolute immunity uh, when they are in office under both international law, universally recognized, and in the United States under common law. Um, the way it works in the United States, if a foreign gov sitting foreign government official gets sued in the United States, the legal advisor, that was me, uh, got to uh, sign a suggestion of immunity uh, which is then submitted by the Justice Department uh, to the courts, which, as you heard from Chris, is then binding on the courts, and the courts then defer. I signed a number of these. One of the more famous ones I signed was on behalf of Pope Benedict, uh, which actually raises an interesting legal issue because he's not only the head of the church, uh, but the head of the uh, head of state uh, of the uh, Vatican State. Um, I was then attacked uh, for that, for saying that the uh, pope should have immunity, but I think it was uh, pretty clear in that case. Um, uh, we touched on diplomatic and consular immunity. That's covered by treaties, by the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. What we're talking about today is the immunity of lower-level officials who are not covered by treaties. So current foreign government officials who are lower than a head of state or foreign minister, or importantly, a former government official, either a head of state who's now a former government official or a lower level former government official, and they get sued often. The number of times that former foreign government officials get sued in the United States over a variety of different things is really quite remarkable. It drives foreign countries crazy. Uh, uh, their first stop was always to come to the State Department to complain uh, 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 that their officials were getting sued, and they, of course, always wanted us, the State Department, to go away. So anyway, I just want to make clear the big picture that we have a number of different immunity doctrines. Um, background on the Samantar case. So before the Samantar case, immunity of foreign government officials lower than the head of state was viewed by the courts as governed by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Uh, the courts mistakenly, in the perspective of us at the State Department, thought that the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act covered not only states, their agencies, and their instrumentalities, but also government officials. The view of the courts was, well, countries can only act through their officials, which is true. Um, and so, therefore, Congress must have intended the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act to provide immunity for officials as well. And so, most courts gave immunity 
to foreign government officials who got sued in the United States. Again, we're talking about lower level officials or foreign officials, but they found that the immunity existed under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. For decades, we at the State Department thought the courts were wrong on this subject, and we kept telling the courts that they were wrong on this subject. Uh, uh, and the, uh, our view was that the immunity of foreign government officials is governed by international law principles and governed by the common law in the United States, i.e. judge-made law, based on uh, suggestions of immunity uh, provided by the State Department. We kept telling the courts this. They wouldn't listen to us. When I was in the Bush administration, we filed a very lengthy uh, brief in a case against the former Israeli intelligence chief, uh, Avi Dichter, who had been sued over a, uh, over a essentially a drone strike. Uh, saying he was sued. He wasn't a head of state. Uh, he was a former official. And we argued that he did have immunity. He couldn't be sued in the United States, but that he didn't have immunity under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. He had immunity under the common law based on a suggestion of immunity uh, given by the United States. Um, the, uh, the Southern District of New York and ultimately the Second Circuit threw the case out. It was an ATS case. And they said, yes, he had immunity, but they did not ultimately decide the issue of did he have immunity under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act or did he have immunity under uh, the common law based on suggestions by the State Department. So after I left office, uh, the State Department finally got a chance to litigate their view up before the Supreme Court. That was the Samantar case, and the Supreme Court did accept the view of the State Department uh, that the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act protects only sovereigns and their agencies, their departments, but not individual officials. In the Samantar case, the Supreme Court said, these lower level officials may well have immunity, but it's not under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. So what we're talking about for the last few years since the Samantar case is what are the contours of immunity for non-head of state, either sitting lower level government officials of foreign governments or former officials uh, in the United States. So that, with that background, I thought, not surprisingly, that the Samantar case was correctly decided, um, but uh, as a practical matter, and this is what I'm now going to talk about, this now puts an enormous burden on the State Department because courts no longer are looking at the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act to determine uh, whether a foreign government official sued in the United States has immunity, uh, but they are looking to suggestions of immunity uh, given by the State Department. What happens then in practice in each case is that each side, plaintiffs and defendants, come in and furiously lobby the State Department with the, the, with the defendant country on behalf of their current or former government official coming in and saying, the person has immunity, they can't be sued. The plaintiffs, and these are generally human rights organizations coming in and equally passionately and very emotionally and usually in a situation involving very bad facts telling the State Department why the individual should not have immunity. So it puts the legal advisor in a tremendously difficult position where you are trying to both balance international law, reciprocity, which is why I made that point earlier, because you want to protect US government officials who might get sued, as well as accountability for human rights abuses. So it puts the legal advisor in a very difficult position. I wrote uh, shortly after Samantar, uh, I, I, I did write a law review article called uh, The Dog That Caught the Car. Uh, you know, the old adage, what, is the, what happens when the dog chases the car and ultimately catches it? You know, what happens then? So this was something the State Department had wanted for many years was to be able to control immunity uh, and then we won. And so now what does the State Department get to do? They get to control immunity, and that's not exactly a fun thing to do. My successor, Harold Coe, renowned human rights lawyer, then found himself in an extremely difficult position of having to both uh, protect immunity but also provide a certain amount uh, of accountability. So, uh, so what's happened in the last couple of years? As you heard from Chris, there have been about a dozen cases against foreign government officials generally brought under the Alien Tort Statute or the Torture and Victim Protection Act uh, against uh, sitting or former foreign government officials below the head of state level. Uh, in each case, the Obama administration has been furiously lobbied by each side, uh, and the administration has, in fact, uh, provided a suggestion of immunity, which is basically a letter Bought, written by the legal advisor, 
determining that the foreign government official has immunity, the letter is sent to the State Department, I'm sorry, from the State Department to the Justice Department. The Justice Department then files that in the form of a statement of interest in the courts. So that has happened in uh, about a half a dozen different cases. Chris uh, uh, laid those all out. Um, there have also been a number of cases uh, 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 where courts, for whatever reason, have decided not uh, to uh, ask the State Department for the State Department's views, or the State Department hasn't provided views, and the court has gone ahead anyway and made a determination of foreign government official immunity uh, on its own. I've actually litigated a number of those cases on behalf of the government of Israel, uh, where I was mentioning this earlier this morning, a series of Israeli judges have been uh, sued for child custody determinations in Israel, where Israeli mothers believe that the Israeli judges have been biased in favor, uh, I'm sorry, the Israeli fathers have sued uh, uh, Israeli judges for generally making child custody determinations in favor of Israeli mothers. So they've lost custody of their children in Israel. So where have they sued? They have sued in the United States. They have sued Israeli judges under the Alien Tort Statute or the Torture Victim Protection Act in the United States. Um, the, these cases have all been uh, tossed out uh, by US courts, uh, generally very quickly based on immunity determinations made by the courts uh, themselves without a uh, determination made by the State Department. I think largely US judges are looking at, gee, would I want to be sued in a foreign country on the basis of a determination that I made in the course of my official duties, or do I have immunity? And they have basically said, of course I wouldn't want to be sued. I have determined that these uh, Israeli judges have immunity. So in any case, we've had uh, maybe a dozen or so foreign government official immunity cases in which the State Department has either provided a suggestion of immunity and the courts have deferred to that, and they've all been accepted so far uh, by the courts, or the courts have made their own determinations of foreign government official immunity applying principles articulated by the State Department. So that's where we stand. I want to just quickly cover sort of what the issues are now four years later. I'm going to cover a couple of practical issues and a couple of legal issues. So the first part was sort of for the students. This part is for, this part's for Kurt. So one, procedural issues. You know, how has this worked in practice? One. There have been tremendous delays. Uh, the State Department has moved very slowly in providing suggestions of immunity. I've written about this at Lawfare. Um, a part of this, I think, frankly, is that the, uh, that, the, that the Obama administration has wanted to avoid providing suggestions of immunity in some of these very difficult cases. So they've looked for ways to avoid filing a immunity determination until it really can't be avoided. So essentially the view is if there are what they call non-salmon tar factors, which basically means the official hasn't been served, uh, there's some sort of procedural defect in the case so that it's not yet ripe, uh, the State Department has delayed in providing a suggestion of immunity. That's happened even in he sitting head of state cases. So in the Rajapaksa case that you mentioned, in the Kagami case, those were head of state cases. It's taken the State Department more than a year to file suggestions of immunity. The um, uh, reason I comment on that is if this happened to the United States in another country, and again, you have to think about these cases in terms of reciprocity. Immunity is all about reciprocity. This is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If President Obama or John Kerry got sued over drone strikes in another country, uh, Spain, where they, some of these officials have been sued, and the foreign country waited more than a year to determine whether they had immunity, the United States would go nuts. And the amount of diplomatic pressure that we would apply on the foreign country would be enormous. Uh, so the delays have been interesting. Um, and in some cases, it's actually forced the defendants to ask the court, to, to, to ask the State Department for its views, in other words, to pull the immunity suggestion out of the State Department. Um, 
A second procedural issue is that it puts the State Department in a very difficult position of determining whether the act of the foreign government official was actually official or not. So it's not really up to the State Department to determine was someone acting in the scope of their employment or not in the scope of their employment. So the State Department has to get certain facts from the foreign government, which requires a diplomatic note to be provided by the foreign government affirming whether the foreign government official was, in fact, engaged in an official act and acting in the scope of their employment. That can take quite a bit of time uh, to work out. And as Chris alluded to, an issue which has begun to happen and is going to be a real problem is, is what happens if there's been a change in government? And often, in some of the, in other countries, you will have enormous animosity between one government and the previous government. So if the immunity of a foreign government official is based on the recommendation and request of the foreign government, but there's been a change in government, the new government may not want to assert immunity on behalf of the officials of the former government. So we've seen that in some cases involving Somalia, including in the Samantar case. Uh, so the foreign government, uh, if it does not assert immunity on behalf of its officials, then it puts the State Department in a very difficult position in determining whether something was official or not. Next we have interagency differences. I can't overstate this enough. Kurt knows this well. Um, just because the State Department wants to assert immunity on behalf of foreign government, the Justice Department may have reasons not to. Or, conversely, the State Department may, for some reason or other, be reluctant to assert immunity on behalf of a foreign government official, but the Defense Department and the CIA, looking out for its own officials, may want the State Department to assert immunity. So these things that look fairly easy, uh, can, there can be a lot going on below the surface in the interagency. Um, next is, uh, because this is very difficult and re results in the State Department getting lobbied a lot, are we really, as Chris said, back in the position that we used to have before the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act? And it would, be, would it be better to try to standardize this practice in some way? Uh, so there's sort of two ways to do this. One would be to issue some sort of general set of principles, like what we call the Tate Letter, uh, uh, where the State Department would issue certain rules for immunity. Now, each case is so different that it would be very difficult to have cover everything. But you could have... Uh, certain rules that would be articulated by the State Department about the immunity of foreign government officials that the courts could then act on based on a brief provided by the foreign government. So the State Department would not have to get involved in every case. And then finally, and I've written a law review article about this, Chris alluded to it as well, is maybe we ought to just give this back to Congress so that we would have a Foreign Government Officials Immunity Act uh, so that the State Department does not get lobbied in every case. I don't, I say that, and in, in, in actually my private, all of this, of course, is my private capacity. I don't think the State Department really like that. They want to control immunity. Um, but on the other hand, I do just note neutrally that it does put the State Department in a very difficult position. So those are the practical issues. Let me end with just a couple of legal issues, um, each of which Chris alluded to. One, are these cases against foreign government official really a case against the official, or are they really a case against the state? I mean, frankly, all of these cases are really against the state. I, I can't think of, off the top of my head, although there may be a few, uh, any one of these alien tort statute cases that is not really trying to challenge state behavior. Since you can't sue the state under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, you sue the officials. Um, uh, Justice Stevens, in the Samantar case, famously said, or it may, be that the case, it may be the case that some actions against an official in his official capacity should be treated as actions against the foreign state itself, as the state is the real party in interest. Frankly, almost all of these cases are against the state itself, and the state is the real party in interest. Um, now, a problem, though, about treating it that way is that if a state, foreign state, comes in and says, hey, this, this, this case against our official is really a case against us. We want to be substituted. One, in what circumstances would that actually happen? What's the dividing line? 
And then, of course, then the State Department doesn't get involved because it's all done under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. So I think that we're waiting for that first case to happen. Second are these use Kogan's cases. Is there a exception for really egregious human rights behavior uh, uh, such that foreign official immunity does not apply in cases where there has been a gross violation of human rights, uh, torture or other things? As you heard from Chris, there's a split in, uh, in the courts on this. Uh, the Second Circuit has said there is no use Kogan's violation. The Fourth Circuit in, in the Samantar case said there is a use Kogan's violation. I've written extensively about this at Lawfare. I think they got this completely wrong, uh, misinterpreting a law review article by Professor Bradley in which the Fourth Circuit famously said um, that they had determined that there was, this is an important conception, that, that they've determined that there is a trend in international and domestic law towards finding a Jus Kogan's uh, exception uh, for foreign government official immunity. That's just wrong. There is no such trend. There are some people who are interested in finding uh, a exception, but under international law, in civil cases, there are no cases. There are no cases. Uh, uh, and so you can, certainly can't say there's a trend, much less that it's actually international law. Uh, now, domestically, and so they had cited a law review article written by Chris and Larry Helfer, which cited criminal cases, but not civil cases. Um, and then domestically, they said they had also determined that there was a trend. And again, there's not really a trend there either. There's a circuit split on these issues. So I think the Fourth Circuit um, just got it wrong there. Um, finally, um, this issue that Chris alluded to is, what is the actual effect of the State Department's suggestion of immunity? In, the, in head of state cases, uh, the courts have determined that those are binding on the courts, that they are essentially ousted of jurisdiction. Once the State Department files a suggestion of immunity, the State Department has said, and the courts have accepted, that when the executive branch speaks, the courts literally don't defer to it. They no longer have jurisdiction of that case over head of state. With respect to lower level officials, the State Department has said the same thing. If we make a suggestion of immunity, if we speak, you and the courts don't just defer to us, you are ousted of jurisdiction. Now that is still a topic still being, I, I guess I won't yet say litigated, but still being discussed. In the Samantar case, the Fourth Circuit did not agree with that. Uh, other courts, though, have said if the State Department speaks with the suggestion of immunity, we consider that binding upon us. So I think that is still an issue that's out there, is the extent to which a State Department suggestion of immunity is actually binding uh, on the courts, ousting them of jurisdiction and forcing them to dismiss these cases. So there are, those are a couple of legal issues that I think are still out there. So finally, I agree with Chris. The, uh, there's still sort of early days after Samantar, both in terms of practice uh, and in terms of the legal issues that are out there, this is a, a, an area that is still evolving. So watch this spot. Well, thanks to both Chris and John for really terrific and uh, very informative presentations. I, my remarks will really just offer some thoughts about some of the open questions that John just mentioned and that are discussed in some of the cases that Chris went through in his slides. And my perspective is primarily as an academic, although as John had indicated, I did also have the privilege of working in the State Department myself as the counselor on international law. And I remember, may have been at least one of the first matters I was asked to help with was a suit brought by the Falun Gong against the then president of China, Zhang Zemin, he was giving a speech in Chicago, and they rushed his bodyguard and threw uh, his, uh, the papers at his feet. And uh, I can't go into details about the case other than to say that it generated some foreign relations friction uh, <laughs> at that particular time. It was eventually dismissed by the It turned out to be a trickier case. It sounds like a head of state case that John was talking about should be relatively easy. He became a former head of state in the middle of the litigation, and it became a little bit messier from uh, the legal perspective, but it still was eventually dismissed. So I, I think I should start at the same place that John started, which is very important to keep in mind the distinction between the immunity uh, that you get, some officials get for their status, 
And when we're talking about heads of state or foreign ministers and the like, uh, they get an absolute immunity under international law, and uh, at least generally speaking, that has been true under U.S. common law as well, while they're in office. And that includes even unofficial private acts. We don't have to get into what kind of acts they engaged in that they're being prosecuted or sued about. Uh, very different for lower level officials, even while they're in office, and all former officials, uh, they get immunity only in a more qualified way. It's called conduct immunity or functional immunity for acts that they took in an official capacity. So they don't get immunity for things that they did privately. Um, and both sets of cases are interesting, although the, we're mainly, mainly focusing on this conduct immunity, I think, in the discussion here. Um, that distinction, though, might have important differences in US law that, so I'll offer some views about things that John had talked about. It may well be that it makes sense to distinguish the amount of deference US courts should give between those two categories of immunity, status and conduct. For status, head of state immunity is at least a reasonable argument that the executive's ability to control that is coming out of the executive's well understood and recognized ability to decide wh who are the foreign sovereigns, who are the legitimate heads of state and governments, the Zivotofsky case, some of you know about the Jerusalem passport case that recently the Supreme Court decided to reaffirm that there was this executive power to recognize foreign sovereigns and make attendant determinations. And I think it reasonably can be said that the executive can make determinations about this absolute status immunity for the heads of government. It's a harder call as to whether the State Department should absolutely be able to bind the courts for the qualified immunity, which is really a mixed question of law and fact turns on each case, depending on what the acts are alleged and the like, and sounds much more of the sort of thing that courts would normally have some say in when cases are properly brought before them. After all, if there's immunity, it defeats otherwise valid claims that a court could hear and uh, takes away their jurisdiction, even to hear a case. And it's not as clear that the executive branch somehow inherently has the power to just dictate the results on these mixed question of law and fact cases even though, as John had indicated, a number of lower courts have been willing to do that. It's an easy thing to do. They don't have to then get into any of the issues that I'll describe. They can simply defer to the suggestion of immunity. So I actually am sympathetic to the four circuits. Uh, this is probably the only part of the four circuits decision. I am sympathetic <laughs> to uh, distinction between giving some amount of deference. I would certainly give weight to the executive's views, and I'll explain how that might work, but not necessarily being absolutely bound by the executives just dictate of immunity for people who don't get absolute immunity. And if courts did not get absolute deference, they would have to develop in more detail some of the standards that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss. And what, so one of the most difficult issues, and it hasn't come up specifically here uh, in, in great detail, so I want to mention it because I think this is, some courts have started to work through this, but not very much, which is if you're getting into conduct immunity, um, how, what kind of standards do you have if you don't simply just follow whatever the State Department says? First of all, State Department, either because of delays, as John mentioned, or policy reasons, they just don't take a position, particularly in the district courts, on some of these questions. So the courts have to decide. Um, well, the Supreme Court did not give us much guidance in Samatar. They simply said, it looks like it's a matter of the common law. Well, what does that really mean, the common law? Um, probably it's some combination, and this is my view, uh, and listen to what I'm, the factors I mentioned. U.S. historical practice, analogs to the immunities we already have in other areas of U.S. law, including in the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, practices of the executive branch, international law, and even consequentialist considerations, including the ones that John's concerned about, such as reciprocity and friction with other nations. That's going to sound very messy and determinate as a standard, but I think that's the nature of the common law. Uh, over time, the idea is that if you have more and more cases, then the standards will become clear, absent some statute or something, as John had mentioned. Um, one important takeaway from that, if that's the common law, is it's not likely to match up perfectly with international law, and we shouldn't expect it to do so. International law is a factor. And in the executive branch, by the way, including in the Obama administration, they merely describe it as a factor in their own thinking about what immunity should look like. And that's probably even more true as the courts would develop this area of law. And in general, that's probably OK from an international law standpoint. There's usually no bar in giving more immunity than might be uh, given under international custom. So 
thinking about all those kind of messy materials, and here I'm now turning to what might, I think, very well likely will be the work of a project that I'm involved in. You probably have all heard of the restatements of law by the American Law Institute. They're in torts and contracts and other areas, and they're also in foreign relations law. And they have been since the 1960s. Uh, a number of us are now in the fourth generation of that project of re foreign relations law, and it looks like that immunity part will probably get to the topics we're getting to, not immediately, but in the next couple of years. And it has been addressed to some extent in the prior restatements. Um, the first, very first restatement, kind of confusingly is labeled the restatement second, it's from 1965, actually has a provision on what is the common law for this conduct immunity for foreign officials. And so it's instructive to go back. In fact, the Supreme Court in Samatar cited it and called it instructive. Uh, they didn't necessarily endorse it, but they, they gave it some weight. And what the restatement said in 1965 was there is immunity, this conduct immunity for foreign officials or former officials, if the effect of a court exercising jurisdiction over them, and here I quote, would be to, quote, enforce a rule of law against the state. There's not a lot of discussion, unfortunately, there about what that might mean. And that was the first restatement. There was another one, Restatement Third, in 1986. You, if you look through it, you will not find this section. What happened? It looks like the Restatement Third thought this was all now subsumed by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. As, and as John and Chris both mentioned, that's what the lower courts had also been assuming by and large. The Supreme Court changed that expectation in 2010. And Sam Tarr said, no, the statute does not cover suits against foreign officials. So there's nothing in the latest restatement being helpful on this. So one, if one wants to look to the restatement, you'd have to go back to the 65 document. And this whole idea of enforcing a rule of law against the state, what does that mean? Well, they gave one example, basically, in that, and you can decide whether you think this is helpful. They said um, that if there was a foreign official driving negligently in the United States and got involved in a traffic accident, suing them for negligence would not be enforcing a rule of law against their state, and therefore they would not have immunity. Um, I have some things to say about that traffic example, which is an interesting one. Uh, note the phrasing of the restatement. It does not say that the judgment has to be enforceable against the state, but the law is being applied against the state. It looks like, and this is me offering my view about what the restatement meant, something like what we call the act of state doctrine in the United States. That is a, that's a common law rule as well that says that US courts are not supposed to pass judgment on the validity of what foreign governments do in their own borders. And similarly, I think the restatement in 1965 is saying, when you're suing a foreign official and evaluating the legality of their conduct involves making a judgment about whether the state has, in effect, violated law then that's when immunity is going to be triggered. But saying that an official was negligent in driving is not saying anything about whether the state has really acted in contravention of law. But it, it's much broader than merely looking to where the judgment ru might run, which is some, what some people have argued. Now, here's the hard part. This is what everybody cares about, not traffic accident cases. What, what everybody cares about is human rights. And the human rights suits, whether they be by the Falun Gong, the case I mentioned, or some of the ones that Chris and John had mentioned, um, or we've heard earlier today. And these are much harder cases under that standard. And the reason is most of those cases do look like, in effect, the law that you're trying to invoke, often international use cogens, human rights norms, or something else, is about trying to say that the state was engaged in torture or genocide or false imprisonment and the like. It is not really just the law about the official. And those cases, at least arguably, run into the standard that the restatement, I think, suggested. And indeed, if in those cases the plaintiffs could sue the foreign state, they would certainly do so. Because they're going to say, they would have, first of all, have a deeper pocket. They could sue the whole state for these terrible wrongs. Why don't they? Congress has said they can't. Congress has not allowed any foreign tort cases against foreign sovereigns under our Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. So instead, they sue people the state acts through but I do think at least arguably it runs into this problem of really still applying, attempting to apply law against the state and raises questions about conduct immunity. They're much harder than the traffic case. By the way, you can sue under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act for traffic cases as well. There's no state immunity either. 
So one of the, in allowing a, a domestic tort cases, the legislative history says our paradigm example, you can sue people for negligent traffic accidents. So it's just a very different example than these foreign human rights cases where Congress had said you may not sue for those, even though we're fine with these traffic cases. Um, what have the lower courts done? Have they given us much help? I've looked, uh, and Chris had looked as well, the last five years of cases, surprisingly little guidance in advance on the issue that I just described. Why? Well, one reason is they've been mainly deferring to the State Department when that has been available to them, or there have been some kind of fact, cases that have kind of peculiar facts that have not uh, necessitated they get into this. Um, okay, so I'll end with kind of the, maybe the most uh, difficult, uh, one of the most difficult questions, and John had raised it, and Chris had mentioned it was um, a conflict in the courts. So I, my view is that merely because it's a terrible human rights wrong uh, does not by itself uh, uh, remove or provide a ground for denying the existence of conduct immunity for former officials, lower level officials. And I think it's very different from, say, the traffic example, as I mentioned. Well, what about the most extreme violations of norms in the international system, that is, use cogens, these peremptory norms, norms against genocide and war crimes and torture. Um, what do we do about those? Even if, in general, we think there might be immunity for bad behavior, what about these most extreme violations? And as Chris had mentioned, there is effectively a conflict now in the courts between the Second and Fourth Circuits in particular over whether there should be a categorical limit or exception on immunity. Um, my own view is that the argument against a categorical exception, that is more in the se Second Circuit's view, is the, is the better one at this point in the state of the materials that we have. And I reached this conclusion based on kind of a common law set of factors, as I had mentioned earlier. By analogs, this is the way the common law works. What are the analogs we have to work with in the law that exists, such as in existing statutes, like the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act? Um, what does it look like in international law based on what we know uh, in de more developed areas? What about some of these reciprocity and friction concerns uh, that I've mentioned? So let me give you some examples. In the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, we know Congress decided specifically not to let use cogent cases be brought against foreign sovereigns. And all of the efforts to sue Germany for the Holocaust, or you name it, any uh, terrible wrong in U.S. courts against the governments themselves have all failed in every circuit court to consider it because the view is that Congress said no, and Congress has not made any categorical exception. The one exception Congress has made uh, is for certain suits against state sponsors of terrorism, but now we have a statute specifically for those cases. Um, in addition, if you look to international law, in the areas that have been more developed by the international tribunals, you find for head of state immunity, uh, Chris mentioned the Belgium case, the Congo versus Belgium case, uh, for state immunity, the Germany versus Italy case, repeatedly finding that there's no categorical use cogent exception for those areas of immunity. Now, I think the response to me, well, those are different. Some of those are status or sovereign immunities. We're talking about conduct immunity here. We might distinguish, I agree. But the reasoning in those cases is as follows, which is that grossly illegal acts, which certainly ought to be remedied in certain ways if we can find a way to do it, say through international tribunals, the International Criminal Court, for example, can still otherwise be official for purposes of immunity in other nations' courts. And I want to emphasize that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about whether there should be accountability. Certainly there should. We're not even talking about whether there should be prosecutions in international tribunals. There's no immunity in those tribunals. We're talking about whether one state should be the adjudicator for the wrongs of another state. And it's a much trickier enterprise. And again, the argument that there's just a categorical elimination or absence of immunity for use cogents doesn't easily find analogs in other areas of domestic or international law. And then finally, because this is common law, because the U.S. courts are in a tricky position, very little guidance from Congress, having to listen to the executive but not necessarily wanting the executive to dictate the outcome case by case, there are reasons for caution until Congress gives us more guidance. 
uh, and that's where I disagree with the Fourth Circuit. And they, they did quote an article that Larry Helfer and I had written. And I wish they had just quoted the next couple of sentences from the paragraph they quoted where we said, by the way, we don't think what we are seeing in the criminal area really is easily transferable to the civil cases like the one before the First Circuit. They just left out a couple of interesting qualifications we had put in. Um, and I think the reciprocity implications are probably better thought through and balanced in the first instance by Congress, uh, working with the executive branch, and not in just the purely common law way, uh, when we have to worry about, there'll be used cogens against, uh, cases against the United States, no question. In fact, there were in Belgium, for example, when they had their universal jurisdiction law, and the United States did everything it could, and finally successfully, to get that law changed. Um, also, you have to keep in mind, uh, when you're thinking about some terrible dictator and we have no sympathies, and that person certainly ought to be sued for everything they're worth, that sounds great, but you have to be ready to say that all these Israeli official cases can go forward, the head Chinese, the many Chinese official cases can go forward, because they're all going to be sued for use cogens. They are. And unless you have some way of figuring out how to distinguish those, this categorical approach becomes very problematic as a policy matter. The final thing, and I just want to emphasize this, you might think, well, this is, an, you know, this is a position that one side might have or another, and maybe that's true. I would emphasize, interestingly, there has been consistency between Democratic and Republican administrations on this issue. So even very recently, the Obama administration filed their brief in the latest round of the Samantar case, again making clear they do not think there is any categorical use cogens exception, exactly, of course, what the Republican administration before them had also said. And I don't think it deserves absolute deference, but I would give weight to bipartisan perspectives on this, particularly when there's such little guidance otherwise being given to the courts. But I'll give a little bit of my final remark will be in a more liberal direction. Congress has done one thing that I think is important. Uh, in this area, which they passed in 1992 a torture protection statute, it's Torture Victim Protection Act, that says uh, there is civil liability for acts of foreign torture and extrajudicial killing. They don't mention immunity, and I wish they had said something about immunity. It would be very helpful one way or the other. My own conclusion, John and I might disagree possibly on this, is that the structure and intent behind that statute is such that there probably should not be conduct immunity in cases properly brought under the statute. It would negate most of the possible uses of that statute, because it already requires you act under color of foreign law to commit the torture or killing. And if all of those were generally subject to immunity, I'm not sure Congress what they were, thought they were doing in 1992. So I think that actually is an instance where Congress probably has decided to let a certain relatively small set of cases go forward. And if we think more use cogens cases should go forward, that's where I would go back to. And I would say the Congress would need to expand that particular statute. Thanks. We have just under 10 minutes for questions and discussion. So uh, I'll let Professor Bradley moderate. Sure. Yeah, please. Uh, Shimin. Uh, I definitely want to give the students a chance to jump in. Uh, and I'm speaking at 2.15. So if I don't get all my questions in now, I'll, I'll come back to them then. Uh, I, I guess, I mean, I think the Dictor brief filed by the Republican administration and the Samantar brief filed by a Democratic administration, I wouldn't necessarily attribute the differences to politics. Um, but just to be clear, I mean, they both said uh, no use Kogan's exception in the civil context. To be very clear, and I don't think I heard anything different from the front of the room, um, you know, there have been very few criminal prosecutions in the US, but to the extent there have been, immunity has not been considered a bar. Uh, and as Kurt points out, the, the trend he identified in his article was with respect to the criminal sphere. Um, but that is the sphere that the International Law Commission, as we'll hear at lunchtime, uh, is looking at at the moment. Uh, but even though both said there's no categorical use Kogan's exception in the civil context, uh, of course, the Dictor brief said there is blanket immunity for any acts you know, done under color of law, whereas the Samantar brief introduces this multi-factor analysis. Um, I think that, that uh, I mean, I, as I've, I've written and cataloged, this idea of you know, countries wanting the State Department, this is largely to obviously um, 
to John's remarks, wanting cases to go away is, I mean, dates back to the late 18th century, and the State Department then actually said, we don't want to have to deal with this. We're pushing it to the courts. Uh, Harold Coe had a, a different reaction, and, and maybe he's regretting it, although since he's no longer in that office, I guess it's not his problem anymore. Um, but, but I do think that, that there are other tools, and of course, the focus of this conference is immunity, but that we need to be thinking of the interaction, and I'll make this point later this afternoon, between various doctrines in dealing with which of these cases, again, to this panel on the civil side, we could talk about criminal later, belong in foreign court, courts or not. I mean, my recollection, I haven't read Dichter in a long time, but my recollection is that the State Department brief and ultimately the decision also alleged that the, the conduct at issue didn't satisfy what we call the SOSA standard. In other words, it wasn't of a, a sufficiently clearly defined, universally accepted norm. Um, it wasn't just a drone strike. Again, my recollection is it was dropping a one-ton bomb on an apartment building. Uh, but, but nonetheless, they, they still found it. It didn't violate that threshold. Um, similarly, the, these Israeli judges' cases that I wasn't familiar with, if they were brought under the ATS and the TVPA, there's no cause of action under the ATS for child custody dispute determinations. There's no jurisdiction under the TVPA. So I, it's interesting to me, and I'd have to look at them as to why immunity was the first place to go. But these are just, there's, there's no claim stated under these statutes. So there's no jurisdiction jurisdiction, you don't even need to get to immunity. Uh, and then I guess, again, I have a, a lot of thoughts, but I don't want to monopolize the time. Uh, you know, with, with the real party and interest, I think that is an interesting thing that both of you talked about. You know, does the real party and interest, and that language you quoted from Justice Stevens, when he was talking about an official suit in their official, official capacity, you know, he was talking about in the CF to Kentucky versus Graham and all of this, he was talking about whose assets are at stake. Um, but I, I, I agree that the second restatement, maybe not so much. And so I think there is some question there. I do, th I do think that Samantar suggests that real party and interest means it's the state's assets rather than the individual's assets that are being sought in the judgment. Um, but that certainly is a particular US law doctrine that hasn't been fully worked out. Um, and I think that there, there's a lot more to say about that. Great. I'll, I'll gather maybe another couple questions up. Uh, so first, let me see if there are uh, people more in the back of the room first. Though. I want to give an opportunity to some students in particular if you have thoughts uh, from any of the presentations. Yes, please. So I just had a question. Um, so all three of you, I think, so I understand that Samantar obviously like said uh, foreign officials are, are not governed, their immunity is not governed by the FSA after, after Samantar. But like, would would y'all agree, like all three, based on what I heard, say that the way you understand conduct immunity is sort of similar to the same sort of restrictive theory idea that we see in the FSIA? Is that that is really like I, I don't know? I, I seem I seem to sort of get that from your talks. I just want to make sure that like that's what I that I'm understanding y'all correctly, in that sense. Well, we uh, I've got that noted, and I'll take maybe another question, and we can see whether there are some responses to those, those three. Uh, all right, yes, yeah, Sarah. So I was wondering, with all these sort of immunity hurdles that people have to bring, let alone the jurisdictional issues, what are the incentives to bring uh, claims in the United States as opposed to going to an international court where they don't have immunity, as you mentioned? Uh, okay, I see so there's so many questions. So I'll take another one, then I do want us to make sure we don't lose track of them. So, Julie. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to push back. I was curious whether to maybe get panelists to reveal a little bit more clearly their views on the level of deference the court should give to the president the statements of interest, which I think is a very interesting domestic separation of powers issue. And I guess I, my understanding of head of state practice was that absolute immunity, I, I don't fully understand the rationale as to why it's so different for conduct immunity. I, I understand that maybe it's a different analysis. I'm not sure it's quite as mixed. It seems like the analogy of the state head of state immunity and getting deference for that, absolute deference, is quite plausible in the foreign government official context. I'm curious whether they think that's wrong or whether the courts are going to go in a different direction on that. Okay. And, uh, I'll take one more. Yes. I have a lot of comments, but I, I only put a question. Uh, with regard to the suggestion of uh, of immunity that uh, you have been that is been denied, I understand taking into account the, the in general the, the, the case law of the US. Uh, the Department of State has the, the opinion of the states uh, of the official. The, uh, if I, I if I have been understood, how 
uh, how will up happens? Uh, what will happens if, at the moment when the immunity, the suggestion of a state, is alleged uh, by the, the Department of State before the court, the court decided that immunity is okay. We will not proceed uh, in this case. And after that, the own states uh, proceed with the same official. Relay with regard with some uh, offenses uh, very close or related with the same official, same offenses that were uh, alleged be before the uh, U.S. state. I am thinking in the the, the Bushilai case. In the Bushilai case. Right. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, yeah, uh, uh, she has been uh, indicted in, in, chi in China uh, several uh, years before, uh, after okay. uh, to be have been recognized uh, the immunity in uh, in U.S. on the basis of the uh, su a suggestion of uh, of immunity and uh, the 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 base for the Chinese decision is not this ident is not the same, but it's very close to the uh, offenses alleged in uh, in in U.S. I I, I have some uh, difficulties to understand uh, in, in this case what what will be the, the position of the Department of State and and I think uh, of that because I'm thinking on the separation of powers, the principle of separation of powers. Very good. So we're going to take the questions. Apologies to anybody who didn't get their question asked, or if we don't respond to all the questions, we, there'll be time after our lunch. We certainly you can talk to people about their views, but I'll let you address whatever you like, Chris. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess the level of deference to. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. We're supposed to move into lunch at 12:15. Oh, okay. I, you know, this is the heart of the conference. What we're supposed to be here for. So, if the panel's okay with it and the participants, would 10 minutes be okay? We just have to move out of the room. No, at least to answer the lunch. question. Sure. Oh, Thank you. you. Yeah, no, no problem. You're most welcome. Um, I would say that the level level of deference to executive branch SOIs. I mean, I think in the context of head of state, uh, the case law is, uh, you know, it's very strong um, towards um, deference uh, to the executive branch. Um, throughout the FISA era, for example, um, we saw that kind of um, deference, um, you know, really even all the way back to the, um, so the foundational case in this area, the Schooner Exchange. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't, as my presentation hopefully drew out, um, I don't believe that we're going to see um, any um, too, well, I should say there's too much chipping away, if you will, um, at head of state immunities. Um, you know, you know, I did mention a few in the, in the slides, but um, I think that is post some, some Antar, um, most likely, and it hasn't actually, um, it's most likely not going to change, um, and, um, and it hasn't really, um, in terms of piercing the veil, if you will, um, in, in these head, um, head of state immunity cases. Uh, for uh, foreign official cases, I, I think, um, you know, in a, to an extent the jury's out, at least to, uh, you're thinking about it um, you know, on purely legal grounds, uh, with the split, if you will, um, in terms of how much deference to give um, executive SOIs, um, suggestions of immunity. Um, I, I, you know, the Fourth Circuit went one way, the second went another. You know, it's, it's kind of, um, I think it's hard to, you know, it's hard to predict where it's going to go there, but it, it, it seems at least at the time, based on what, what uh, um, was said uh, by uh, Mr. Bellinger, um, is that, um, you know, it looks like uh, we're going with, um, in practicality, um, fairly absolute deference um, in the foreign official context, too. Uh, whether that um, needs to maybe change as we move forward, um, uh, you know, since, look, the Fourth Circuit said we have considerable deference but not binding deference to um, executive SOIs in the foreign official um, context, there might be some wiggle room there, if you will, for courts um, to uh, take a more proactive approach um, in some of these areas like human rights um, and so forth in terms of whether um, to, in each and every case, um, you know, agree with um, the executive SOI. So there, that, I think, is to, if there's, to the extent there's any wiggle room in terms of deference to executive SOIs, it's in the foreign official context, um, post um, uh, Samantar. Um, and we saw that with the Fourth and Second Circuit split. Did that address? Okay. Uh, great, uh, great questions. Let me, let me take a couple of them. So uh, well, one, Shaman, I, I basically agree with all of your points. And the only thing I would say, frankly, to the extent there are actually differences between the Bush administration brief in Dictor, which laid out the U.S. government's position on official acts immunity in the Samantar case, is basically just 
probably represented passage of time and uh, that allowed, you know, the facts in each case were dramatically different. And when you think about, you know, all of us know, you know, different facts make different laws. So in that case, we were thinking about, you know, should an Israeli government official who was the defense man, or I guess he was the intelligence chief at the time, be sued in U.S. courts about something that was, you know, you know, indisputably an Israeli military action, should he be able to, you know, the answer to that was basically going to be no, and that was not the time to lay out, you know, 22 different factors. When you have the, a former Somali warlord responsible, you know, arguably for the deaths of a whole lot of people who's then living in the United States, uh, that raises different issues that we then laid out. You know, I probably, I might well have signed the same brief that the, so, and furthermore, these briefs were basically written by career officials in state and justice, so it, that I would not draw, you know, significant distinctions between. Um, on the restrictive theory, um, no. Uh, the, the, in fact, one reason why the State Department for 30 or 40 years has believed that foreign government official immunity is not governed by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is that we didn't think that the exceptions in the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act should apply to officials. Let me give you a specific example. So the most, one of the most famous exceptions in the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is the commercial acts, uh, commercial activities exception. If those, and that's the, the basis on the restrictive theory, so that states can be sued for their commercial acts, but you don't want their officials to be sued for the commercial acts on behalf of a state. So it, it, if the same exceptions, the restrictive theory applied to officials, then every foreign government official who signed a contract on behalf of the state could then get sued for that contract. And that's not what we want to have happen. That was really one of the reasons why the State Department uh, supported the differences. Um, the, on, if I understood the question on international tribunals, I basically just say I thought Kurt had it exactly right. And I think this is, this is a really important question for particularly the students in the room, is nobody is arguing that there shouldn't be accountability uh, you know, for these bad things. The question is where should it be done? Should foreign government officials be able to be sued in US courts so that US judges are then uh, deciding whether some foreign government official actually violated international law? Um, and you know, immunity concepts say you shouldn't be able to be sued in a foreign court, but in an international tribunal, um, entirely appropriate. Um, on that, I would urge you to, I wrote a lawfare piece about three years ago, which no one has ever answered. So I would know all, all the students in the room who have your laptops up. Um, I posed a, a question to which no one has given me an answer, which is essentially, you are the legal advisor for the State Department. You want to hold f bad foreign government officials accountable for their acts of genocide. Um, but if you do what many human rights groups have urged, which is recognize an exception for use Kogan's violations, then every US government official is going to get sued. So you're the legal advisor for John Kerry or President Obama. If you actually then say, you know, I think it would be a good idea to have a use Kogan's exception so that people can get sued for their bad acts. Probably the people who are going to get sued faster than the foreign government officials are going to be the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the President. Now, I, in private conversations, pose this to my friends in the human rights community who say to me, well, you know, at the end of the day, let them get sued, and if Hillary and John Kerry and, and President Obama haven't done anything wrong, they'll be okay. Well, if you make that, if you're the legal advisor of the State Department and you basically make that argument to the President, the Secretary of State, they will have a new legal advisor in about 10 <laughs> minutes. So, but it's a real question. I mean, if you are, you want these two things to happen. This was the point about balance. You want, you know, the bad people to be held accountable. But, you know, do we think President Obama should be sued all around the world for drone strikes? Some people do think so. So. Look at that. If you write a note on it and provide me the answer to the question, send it to me. Um, uh, finally, um, uh, Concepcion, if I understand your question, and this was this sort of related to one of my questions as well, is so if a foreign government asserts immunity uh, for its officials, um, the, and then and then the case is dismissed, but then it decides to prosecute its own people later on that would not 
really have an effect on the United States. Because uh, uh, what the foreign government is saying is, we do not, our officials continue to have immunity in a foreign court, i.e. the United States. That doesn't mean that we can't hold them accountable at home. In fact, that's really what the whole International Criminal Court's complement, uh, complementarity principle is about, is, is that individuals are supposed to be held accountable at home before they are held accountable abroad. Yeah, yeah but my concern is deeper, Enrico. So mm. that if uh, the, the, the Department of State vetting the institution only in the, in the opinion of the foreign states, uh, what is the value of this opinion uh, if the foreign state say, is my official, he act on uh, official capacity, and for this reason, uh, is uh, the act of this uh, official is my own act, and after that, the same state prosecuted same people on, this, on the basis of the same act uh, in their private act. No, well, no, 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 oh. no, not absolutely private act. They qualify as, as private acts before their own courts. Right. I think mm -hmm. that there are some kind of contradiction. Well, I think you're right about that. That is the I problem. Think it might, but the U.S. government basically would have to be guided by what the foreign government said officially to the United States government. They might well know that later on the foreign government was acting in a contradictory way. Yeah. Do you want to add on to um, I'll make one comment because we're going to, I think, then break. Um, and it's a bunch of things I could say, but I wanted to answer your question, uh, Julian, uh, or Julian, about the deference because uh, I had suggested I thought there should be a distinction, and I do. So I, I begin with the proposition that if you filed a valid claim, we have a separation of powers question about why the executive should be able to stop your case. I just, there's a question there for me. It's properly filed, there's a law that is cognizable, injured parties. So I, I go to where the source of law is for the executive to defeat the claim if there's not a statute, for example, in place. Um, and I think a reasonable argument can be made that there's this recognition power, the Supreme Court itself has said implied by the ambassador clauses and the like, the Zivotofsky case, uh, applies to head of state because we know international law says you get absolute immunity. Once we figure out who the right head of state is, it kind of solves itself, in those, like the Zhang Zemin case I mentioned. Once it's clear the State Department said this is a recognized head of state, that person's supposed to get immunity. I don't, it's not as clear to me where the executive gets the authority to say, I understand this person might or might not be entitled to immunity under international law, but I just want to stop this case. Um, what's the executive's clause of the Constitution they're using? They don't have a statute uh, to defeat an otherwise valid legal claim in court. Now, what I hear people say is, well, the executive gets control of foreign affairs. I actually know of no such power. Uh, and the Supreme Court in Zivotofsky said, went out of the way to say that is not true. They said this Curtis Wright dicta, the executive loves to quote it, wrong, okay? <laughs> Curtis Wright is not correct on that. You have to go back. So my, my biggest prediction- You didn't spend enough time no, with us at the I State know, I, I, You I, need I, to come I back not indoctrinated. Re remedial training. <laughs> when I count the justices on the Supreme Court, I do not find five votes for giving absolute deference on all of these issues. I just don't. Four liberals, you're gone. They're not gonna do it. Kennedy, it's way too categorical for him. He wants more balancing in the like. That's five, you already lost five. Then I think Scalia is gonna say no. Because where's the Constitution on this? Where's the law, the source of law? He's very formalist about this. So you get, it's probably six to three against deference on these more you know, fact-specific cases. So not that everything should be based upon predictions, but I think their predictions is reflected in the fact that the arguments for absolute deference, and if you look at the cases that are giving deference, they don't even analyze it. They just say, oh, we know we're supposed to do it, so here it is, uh, here's immunity. And they think that's historically true, there's almost no cases before 1976. It was like the Supreme Court and Tammany are noted, like there's, we have to really stretch a couple unpublished decisions. Um, so I just don't see historical gloss. I don't see constitutional text. I don't see a statute. And I begin with some separation of powers worries. I don't like the executive. You know, why would the executive turn off a case? Maybe because the law is a problem for that case, but maybe because we're just friends with that country. And I don't like the idea of each case deciding, being decided by whether we're friendly with India or Israel, but we're not friendly with some other. That's just, there's some rule of law question. That was, anyway, that's my answer to that. But I wasn't in the State Department long enough to change that uh, particular uh, view. So anyway, thanks for the, uh, the great presentation. And thanks for the really good questions as well. So. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, so. The